Greetings, everyone. The time right now is 8.59. We will be starting this presentation right at 9.05. Thank you all for joining the Promise on National Coalition Federal Convening. Today's topic, role of arts and culture in strengthening communities. Again, we will get started right at 9.05. We've had a number of more people join us. So I wanna jump in real quickly and let everyone know that this presentation will start in exactly four minutes. We appreciate you all jumping on with us this morning for our National Prom Zone Coalition Federal Convening. Again, at 9.05, we will start this presentation. Time is 9.03 uh, in exactly two minutes. We'll go ahead and start this presentation. Again, we've had a, a couple more individuals join. I wanna welcome you to the 2020 Promise Zones National Federal Convening. Uh, we will start this presentation right at 9.05.
All right, everyone, welcome to the 2020 Federal National Promise Zone Federal Convening. Today's topic is around role of arts and culture in strengthening communities. We appreciate everyone who's had the opportunity to log in. We look forward to sharing some information with you today. Really quick, I would like to go over some housekeeping rules. One, we would ask all participants who are a part of this uh, Zoom meeting to stay on mute. If you have any questions, please use the chat uh, function below. Put all questions in the chat function. We are monitoring those chat functions and we will answer those questions accordingly. But we do ask that you do stay on mute and ask all questions through the chat format. There will be a place and time for questions to be answered for this presentation. Again, uh, we do appreciate you all uh, joining us today. The presenters will have their emails and information available if your question is not answered. We will make sure that they get that question answered to you by email or uh, some exchange of communication. Once again, uh, as more people jump on, uh, we've had a few. I have, we do request that we you do stay on mute during the whole presentation and that you ask all your questions through the chat format. As stated before, we will be reviewing those. And from there, we will be answering questions and presenting those to the presenter during the presentation. There will be opportunities during the presentation for questions to be answered. With that being said, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Ms. Johnny. It's all yours. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Johnny Lattimore, and I am the HUD Community Liaison for the Westside Promise Zone here in Atlanta. I'm excited to be your moderator this morning for today's funeral, federal convening um, with the session titled Role of Arts and Culture in Strengthening Our Communities. I know locally, NEA funding has assisted a lot of community partners that are transitioning to virtual platforms due to the pandemic. This funding has allowed them to continue to reach some of our most vulnerable residents. So today we will be presented with some great information and some best practices regarding these resources. From Jennifer Hughes from the National Endowment for the Arts and Nick Cretion of Economic Action Group of Youngstown, Ohio. Before we proceed, as Silas mentioned, any questions during the presentation can be entered into the chat box. I will be monitoring that chat box. And at the end of both presentations, we will have our question and answer session. Um, so now we will proceed with the introductions and we'll start with you, Jen, and follow up with Nick. Great, thank you so much, Johnny. Uh, thank you to all of you. It's really great to be with you this morning. I am based in Washington, DC, and I've been with the National Endowment for the Arts, a federal funding agency uh, for almost 10 years now primarily connected to the program that I'm gonna speak a lot about today, our Our Town Creative Placemaking Program. So I'm really looking forward to sharing a lot of information about the agency and the funding opportunities, some of the projects we fund it, and I'm particularly excited to hear from Nick. It's always a lot more fun to hear some tactical responses on the ground and really witness the great work that grantees are doing in community at the intersection of arts, culture, and community development. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Nick Creation of, of Youngstown, Ohio, as Johnny said, uh, lifelong resident here, um, went to school here and as well as uh, up in Cleveland. So I have the real regional perspective of Northeast Ohio uh, and small to mid-sized cities where, where this project took place. Um, in place, which I'll be talking about is a little bit of a throwback project from the past few years uh, here in Youngstown, but uh, will also show the lasting impact that, that projects like this can have on a community and maybe some lessons that we learned throughout the way to, to help you in future projects. Great, we welcome you both at the start of the presentation. So I guess we'll proceed now with the session. So Jen Hughes will let you share your screen so we can be prepared to receive a lot of this great information. Great, thank you. All right. Well, just to give you a little bit more of a, a personal context, um, I've always been incredibly passionate about the wonderful work happening in the Promise Zones across the country. I'm trained as an urban planner, so I really come to this work from that perspective and recognize 
how critical it really is for housing, transportation, social services, education, arts and culture to always be working in tandem. So I really admire the incredibly difficult work that you all are doing on the ground to steward such important partnerships, um, but it really is showing in the impacts that you're having locally. So as I mentioned, I oversee our design and creative placemaking program at the agency. But I'm going to make sure that you get a good overview because you might have partners, organizations, no others who might want to tap into some of the other funding resources we have as well. And as you can see, my email's up there on the screen. Make sure to add it into the chat box. Happy to follow up if we're not able to address your questions or if you want to make a connection in the future. So very quickly, just for those of you who might not know about the National Endowment for the Arts, we are a federal funding agency. I think the, the word endowment is a bit of a, a misnomer. Um, we receive our appropriations from Congress on an annual basis. And for FY20, our um, total federal budget was $162 million. Just to give you context, we're, we're small, but I really like to believe that we're mighty in sort of the ways that we can support local communities and, and how we work with partners that are all across the country. So primarily we award grants. We give out roughly $100 million in grants, fund 2,400 projects all across the country on any given year. Um, we manage national initiatives with a lot of great partner organizations. I'll touch on a couple of those in a moment. So those happen typically through our cooperative agreements mechanism, where there may be funding that's granted out more locally um, or actually providing some, some support or services there. We also have a really robust uh, research office at the National Endowment for the Arts, where we both conduct research based on federal data sources, as well as fund arts research. And I think that's important to just lift up as you are doing case making, looking for data around the creative economy, arts and cultural impact, um, we have some great resources, publications, and data sets that you can tap into. And then lastly, we have a really great blog that you should follow along if you would like, um, just to see how this work is touching down locally. We do a series of podcasts. We host some really wonderful convenings throughout the course of the year, some of which have gone virtual um, in this time of COVID. So I just really encourage you to check out our website, arts.gov, and you'll be seeing a new look of that website uh, coming later this fall. So it, it will be a little bit more updated and I, I'd like to believe snazzy. Before I dive too deeply into NEA's work specifically, I just thought it's helpful to give some context. All of the NEA staff are based in Washington, DC. There's roughly 150 of us, but we work with a variety of partners throughout the field that could really serve as valuable resources on your projects. State arts agencies and regional arts agencies receive 40% of the funding from our agency to then grant out locally. And I included this web link here just so you can get to know your state arts agency because they might be a great funding resource or a partner on your project or might even be able to provide some great connections uh, throughout the state to really learn from your peers. So I just wanted you to be aware of, of that resource. So you can certainly apply for funding at the NEA, but also make sure you're taking a look at the state arts agency programs as well as the regional arts agencies. National initiatives, as I alluded to, just want to call out a couple here, but they may be some programming that um, you've either been a part of locally or are really interested in getting engaged in. Poetry Out Loud is this really fantastic program that takes place um, in high schools all across the country where students memorize and recite poetry and it becomes a national competition competing on the state level and then ultimately the national level and schools can opt into that program and really participate in a, in a wonderful way. We have the NEA Big Read program, which is um, really about sharing a good book throughout your community. We provide grants through a, a partner organization to support community reading programs. Um, sometimes libraries host a series of conversations or performances or activities connected to the Big Read program. It's a great, great resource to tap as well. And Creative Forces um, is our military healing arts network. This is a partnership that we have with the Department of Veteran Affairs and the Department of Defense, which is really about improving health, wellness, and quality of life 
for the military and veteran populations. And they are beginning to roll out some additional grant opportunities to fund some community pilot programs. I don't work directly on any of those, but I'm happy to connect you to the folks within our agency who can really educate you a bit more on the opportunities there. But you can also take a look at the national initiatives web link that I included here. A couple other programs, um, this is not all of them, but I thought these might be of most interest to this audience. Uh, one that I do oversee and work on is our Mayor's Institute on City Design. So this is a wonderful program that really encourages mayors to think of themselves as chief urban designers in their community, um, particularly thinking about the role that the design and built landscape plays in driving equity in place. So if your mayor hasn't participated in this program yet, we'd love to invite them in and encourage them to go through the Institute so that they begin making some of their decisions with that, that knowledge on hand. We also have a great program called the Citizens Institute on Rural Design, which is um, a program that's been operating since the 90s that's really about delivering technical assistance to rural communities around the role of design in driving local economic and community development. And lastly, we have a pretty robust arts education partnership. A really fantastic colleague of mine oversees the arts education portfolio at the agency. Happy to connect you in with her um, to connect on grant opportunities or some of the wonderful research and partnerships that are underway with the Department of Education. So that's just a little snapshot of, of some of the ways we work outside of our direct grant making. But I'll spend the most of our time today talking about that, those direct grants. So really there are two big buckets for organizations to access funding at the National Endowment for the Arts. We have the Grants for Arts projects, um, and these are project activities that take place between one and two years for the creation, presentation, exhibition, education, or services to the arts and cultural field. Um, my guess is you have each participated in some activity in your community that has been funded through this program uh, at some point in time. We make grants in every congressional district of the country each year. Um, so our, our reach is really deep across the rural, tribal, urban, suburban spectrum. And um, we have two annual deadlines for this program. This is a great time to really be talking to all of you as you think about the coming year and um, February and July are the deadlines for the Grants for Arts Projects category. And I included this note at the bottom here, um, nonprofit 501c3 organizations, units of government or federally recognized tribes are the eligible entities to apply. So you might be an individual artist who wants to think about how you can access some funding at the agency and you'll really need to be working with one an organization, a government entity or federally recognized tribe. Um, and your work can appear in a project budget proposal to the NEA, but you can't apply directly to the agency. That's why I like to lift up our state arts agency um, partners, because a lot of them can actually make direct grants to individual artists. And then the other opportunity is the Our Town Creative Placemaking Program. And I think this is really a sweet spot for the Promise Phones. And it's great to have Nick here to really share a little bit more about um, how the Our Town Creative Placemaking Grants seeded some wonderful work in Youngstown that lives on beyond the life of the actual grant period. And these are for projects um, that require a partnership between a local government agency or a federally recognized tribal government and at least one nonprofit 501c3 partner. Um, these grants range between 25,000 and 150,000 and we have an annual deadline in August of every year. So that just passed, but certainly something to look towards in the future as you're thinking about some longer term uh, visioning that you might be doing in your community. So just the quick mechanics, I'm not gonna to dive too deeply into this because the deadlines are a bit far off, but things to be thinking about, um, like accessing all other federal funding, you must apply through grants.gov. So the lead applicant organization has to have their um, grants.gov account up and running, 
they have to make sure that they've registered with the system for award management. And I think this will probably mean something to you if, if you've applied or accessed federal funding before, but that's okay, even if you haven't. I just wanna make you aware that there are some bureaucratic steps to go through that um, you wanna start exploring right now um, so that you can do it well in advance of the deadline, get all your paperwork in place so that you can apply for funding. And so in step one, you apply through grants.gov with a very short form, this application for federal assistance, and you submit it. And if you do that successfully, part two of the application is our own controlled applicant portal. So this is where we will ask very specific questions about your project activities, information about your organization itself. You submit a project budget, um, lift up the biographies of key individuals that might be involved in the project, and as well as work samples. And we try to keep this opportunity as simple as possible to describe a one to two year project that you are really hoping to focus on. But just to give you a preview into what it takes to pull together an application, I wanted to alert you to those two parts of um, the application process. The good news is our grant guidelines don't change that dramatically year to year. So you can see this past year's grant guidelines up on our website on arts.gov. You can see the types of questions that we ask as part of the project proposal, as well as even explore that technical step of getting registered with grants.gov. So taking a step back and just talking a little bit more about the agency, when you're applying into the agency, you're applying into one of these artistic discipline categories. So there is a director that oversees um, each of these program areas at the agency. I highlight it creative placemaking and design because that's really the sweet spot that I oversee and operate. But you can be applying, you know, I would really just encourage you to spread the word through organizations throughout your community that there are a wide range of, um, there's the one funding opportunity, but a wide range of project activities that we can really support and fund in these discipline categories. And I think that one thing that's really nice, every single one of our staff members are up on our website. We're really accessible. I always encourage folks to email at this time just because we're all working remotely, um, but certainly you know, we do phone calls with prospective applicants all the time to talk them through this process and really help them think through a project that would potentially be competitive in these programs. You don't have to pay too close attention to this other than I wanted to really emphasize that we have sort of a long runway for applying for our grant programs. So I say that because it's great to be thinking far out in the future. Some organizations really use this as a planning tool to start putting forth a longer term uh, plan for their organization and the activities they wanna do. So for example, this was for the Our Town grant deadline. Um, it closed on August 6, 2020. Um, and the awards are not announced until April of 2021 with the earliest start date being July 1st of 2021. So you really are looking out 11 months from the time of application to when you can begin project activities. So I even encourage folks, if it's not fully baked, put your best foot forward as what you might envision taking place in a year from now. And um, there's opportunity, should you be awarded grant funding to revise, modify, sort of change some of the details of your project and the project budget. But I think this is an important thing to lift up just so, you know, if you're applying for funding, you're not going to be able to access it two months from now. You're really looking at a longer runway from the time of application to the time of award and beginning your project activities that are funded and supported by the agency. So those are the two um, main opportunities. We do offer um, literary arts fellowships to individuals. We have some great national initiatives where we're partnering with other organizations that are granting out funding or offering services to the community. But if you're applying for direct competitive grants at our agency, you're gonna to apply to either the Grants for Arts projects or Our Town or perhaps both if you have two distinctly different projects ready to apply to the agency. Now these opportunities require a one-to-one -one match requirement. We are really flexible in working with our grantees to make up that match as in-kind. 
Um, there have been proposals sort of in Congress around waiving that match, particularly during this time of COVID. Um, until that's legislated, we're unfortunately not able to waive that one to one match requirement, but um, it's possible that it could be in the future. Just wanted to lift that up, but we do accept in kind matches. So volunteer hours, donated space, donated materials. We really uh, like to work closely with um, applicants to help them get creative and thinking about how to make up that match. Okay, so I just wanted to transition into what I think is a little bit more the, the fun part of the presentation, just to give you some inspiration to lift up some details about our Our Town Creative Placemaking Program, because I think this is the program of all in the agency that align really nicely with the goals of the Promise Zones. So when we're talking about creative placemaking at the agency, we're really talking about the integration of arts, culture, and design activities into efforts that strengthen communities specifically by advancing local economic, physical, or social outcomes in a place. So we love to fund um, arts activity, arts after school activities. That's wonderful. We love to fund exhibitions, festivals. But when we're talking about creative placemaking, we're really talking about activities that are very specifically focused in catalyzing a longer term vision for the community where arts and culture is really at the table in your comprehensive longer term planning. And I like to talk about this because arts and culture has a really unique role to play um, in this space. Artists are incredibly equipped at really illuminating um, key and wonderful assets in community, lifting those up. They're wonderful and creative at energizing, bringing new energy to a place, um, helping to energize and galvanize the community around a particular issue, or even just providing some vibrancy um, in a place where maybe residents didn't necessarily always feel safe in gathering. They're incredibly well equipped to really imagine new futures for a place in creative ways. Um, so I, I encourage you to think about the artists in your community and in your place as wonderful untapped assets in advancing your community goals. And lastly, artists are incredibly adept at connecting across community, connecting disparate populations of people, connecting places that might otherwise um, be more socially isolated. And I'm gonna lift up some examples of the projects that we funded across the country that will highlight some of those. So as I mentioned, the Our Town program, creative placemaking requires a partnership, at least the local government or federally recognized tribal government and nonprofit arts and culture organization. But I think what you'll hear from Nick is that it takes a lot of different partners to really make these projects work. And uh, that's kind of the messy part of the creative placemaking work. But all of you know that well, you know, being part and connected to the Promise Zone Initiative. Uh, but ultimately, it helps to really catalyze new ways of working locally that's really more comprehensive uh, and I think really exciting. So I lift this up when we talk about creative placemaking, the objective within the Our Town program is to strengthen communities. And that can take many different forms, depending on your local community context and what your residents are looking to make happen in their place. You know, it could be economic change, really driving local business growth. Um, it could be about preventing displacement. Um, not to suggest that arts and culture is a panacea to address any of these things in isolation, but it really can be artists, cultural organizations, and culture bearers locally can really help to bring about in partnership um, some really incredible impacts locally. Could be about physical changes. Um, we're able to fund design projects that are public art that really beautifies a place or transforms public space. Could be about social change, um, improvements to social relationships, civic engagement, amplifying a community identity, um, sort of driving community attachment or social capital. And the North Star that creative placemaking is really hoping to drive is this longer term systems change. And um, do you, you all know this well, that's what you're trying to do locally is really providing improvements to the community capacity to over the long term 
integrate arts and culture as a strategy to advance uh, local change. And I think what's really important to emphasize is that the Art Town program centers artists, uh, really making sure that artists are being compensated, funded, playing a critical role in these projects, that there's a deep level of community buy-in and engagement, that these are community-driven activities, um, and that there is this partnership sort of all working in tandem to to lead towards this longer term systems change. Will a one to two year project result in this? Not necessarily, but this is kind of the North Star that we encourage folks who are applying to the r -Town program to be thinking about um, as a way of pulling together their application. So what does this actually look like? We can fund arts engagement activity, artist residency programs, festivals, community co-creation of art, performances, public art, temporary public art. Um, we can fund cultural planning, uh, cultural district planning, creative asset mapping, if you're just beginning as a community to really think about how you put forth a longer term cultural plan. Um, maybe that first activity is really to do some thoughtful asset mapping. And, and when we talk about asset mapping, we're not just talking about, you know, the arts institutions with a capital A, your symphonies, orchestras, we're talking about those local choir and church groups. We're talking about those histories of a place, um, sort of the really robust culture that exists everywhere in this country. So think really inclusively about that. It's not just about physical institutions. And artists can be really creative in the way that they engage the public in undertaking that type of activity. We also can fund public art planning. We can fund design activities. So sort of hiring of an architect, uh, landscape architect, um, public space designer, uh, designing of artist space, designing of cultural facilities. And I think it, one thing I, I don't wanna neglect to share is that while we can't fund construction, we can fund everything up to the point of construction. So architectural drawings, fees, et cetera. And lastly, we also can support uh, creative business development, professional artist development. And we have lots of great examples of projects in our portfolio around that. So I just like to flash up this map um, because we've funded over the last decade, over 600 projects in communities all across the country, all shapes, all sizes. Um, with really diverse contexts, and this work looks differently uh, in each place across the country. So you shouldn't be trying to um, kind of just emulate one particular project uh, that sort of strikes your fancy that you learn about, but really trying to start from that place of asset-based development and understanding what is it that makes your place unique? Who are the artists and community that you can really be thinking and partnering with to help achieve the, the longer term goal that you are, are trying to uh, drive towards. So just a couple quick projects, just kind of get the creative juices flowing, get you sort of excited and thinking about what might be possible. Um, we funded this project in Oasis, California, a rural community, primarily Hispanic community that does not have great access to public spaces. But there was a wonderful opportunity between this desert recreation district, their sort of local government entity, as well as this great design nonprofit, Kunkui Design Initiative, that partnered to create outposts of community engagement all across the all across the um, region to really gather what did residents want to see in terms of the district's longer term capital investment in public space. Um, what were the stories, places, needs that really could be lifted up? So this was a pretty creative community engagement project. So you can also be thinking about how do you put artists to work in this type of context of rethinking the town hall meeting, really rethinking about how they go out and engage in community. And, and there can be some really creative and fun ways to um, galvanize uh, the local residents to participate in this process and help inform the future. We also have funded temporary public art um, installations to prototype, again, some longer term ideas that ultimately might be built into capital funding programs. So in this case, um, in, the, in Mesa, Arizona, this was a partnership with um, the city as well as a local CDC 
to really think through how do we program sidewalk spaces where people can play, gather, connect, and what role can artists and designers play in, in helping to think about that really creatively, going beyond sort of just the, the bench, um, but what could some street furniture look like that really breathes new life into a place and offers an opportunity for youth that might not necessarily have access to public space within you know, their 10 minute walk shed but the streets are a place to um, really activate and be thinking about this. We funded a, a wonderfully exciting project in Indianapolis um, called Pre-enactment Theater. So if you think about reenactment theater, you know, you're reenacting the past. This was really intended to pre-enact and imagine the future. So this activity took place over, I believe, two or three days where it was a um, pretty robust street festival. There were vendors, there were incredibly beautiful mural paintings, there were performances where the community was engaged to um, act out stories of their local place, but also it was not just that one to two day activity. It was about the two years leading up to it that formed community groups organizing to really come together to think about what they would like to see in this Manon district over the longer term. Um, we've also just funded cultural facility planning processes um, in Santa Fe, New Mexico. The Santa Fe Arts Institute is sort of expanding into a currently vacant shopping center, have done a series of design charrettes um, to really think about what are some of those community needs and how can this new cultural facility be responsive to those. Um, this is a really fun project that I love to always lift up and talk about based in Austin, Texas, my park, my pool, my city. Partnership between Forklift Dance Works and the City of Austin Parks and Recreation Department. Um, it, it really began from this place of um, the, the pools with that were overseen by the Parks and Recreation Department, the public pool system in Austin was really um, over the long term disinvested and primarily in the neighborhoods of uh, the underserved communities. They, those resources have been ignored. There hadn't been a lot of money put into maintaining those pools. And the Parks Department was really thinking about just closing those down. This choreography dance company came together to partner with the city to do a whole series of community engagement and outreach um, to do performances and activities that lifted up why people loved their pools and why they were so critical and important to invest in. And this helped to really start catalyze an incredible conversation locally that led to a bond measure that was passed of $150 million to be invested in the Parks and Recreation Department to go back into funding and supporting those pools. So this was an incredibly creative way, perhaps just hosting a town hall meeting to discuss the maintenance needs of these public pools um, when it result in the turnout that a series of choreographed performances where the residents were interacting with the recreation department um, folks who were took pride in the work in maintaining the pools and, and wanted additional resources to support that. And these activities are happening in smaller towns all across the country. Uh, the city of Granite Falls population, I wanna say 1500, um, they are hosting their first artist in residency program. So we're funding a pilot to fund and support an artist in residence to work with the public works department um, to think about the ways that they can better meet the needs of their local community. In the city of Gretna near New Orleans, um, they are partnering to host a series of activities that are really focused on transportation. They want to be better connected to the city of New Orleans, draw folks across the river. And they're doing that through creative artist residencies on the ferry system, um, public art. This is just a sample photo of something they've done in the past to really bring awareness and connectivity between the city of Gretna and uh, New Orleans. And this is a project I love to lift up because it took place squarely in the Promise Zones. Um, and the Promise Zone was this incredible framework for pulling together this coalition of partners. Um, it was led by the City of Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership for the Alliance for California Traditional Arts. And it really was about cultural asset mappings, 
uh, a celebration of activities that took place throughout the Promise Zone and plugged into that longer term initiative and plan for a place and gave voice to a lot of those um, uh, incredibly robust cultural groups and activities that were under resourced and to lift up sort of the value that they bring to the place and also make the case for future investment. In San Juan, this was also a um, creative asset and cultural planning process that we funded um, throughout a, the series of neighborhoods in Santurce. And this was a project that we funded back in 2015. And what obviously we all know has happened since um, Hurricane Maria was devastating and Puerto Rico continues to face a lot of really difficult disasters. And being able to point back to the um, cultural asset mapping that took place pre-hurricane helped to make the case for resource investment and rebuilding and what was really there and what potentially could be lost in the aftermath of a disaster. Um, so these projects, while they might reflect a point in time, they really are critical to sort of preserving and supporting um, the incredible cultural heritage and the individuals and the small organizations that uh, you know make our places all across the country so unique and wonderful to live in. In New York, um, we funded a project called Claremont Illuminated, and this was a partnership with the Office of Criminal Justice, um, engaging youth in media arts production, which also served to illuminate places where residents might not have felt super comfortable traveling. Um, you know, these dark staircases, darker overpasses, but it wasn't just about like flashing up public art. It was also about that community co-creation and how it was really a way to engage youth in um, they know their neighborhood best and they have some great, incredible creative ideas and ways to contribute um, kind of lifting up the local culture and also things that that make people feel welcome and intrigued and excited while they're there. And Deep Center is a wonderful organization in Savannah. They've done a series of different partnerships um, with youth around local asset mapping, local storytelling workshops, oftentimes in partnership with different departments of local government to help lift up a particular policy issue or challenge. In Pittsburgh, we funded a partnership um, between the Greater Pittsburgh Arts Council and the City of Pittsburgh. The Mayor's Initiative was about this welcoming America and welcoming the new immigrant community there. And arts and culture was a way to lift up that cultural diversity and also bridge residents who had lived in Pittsburgh for a very long period of time with those new immigrant communities to really engage in cultural activities and exchange. Um, throughout the course of a one to two year period. And this was an exciting cultural facility project. The um, First Peoples Fund partnered with the Oglala Sioux Tribe in the Pine Ridge Reservation, also a promise zone, to create a new cultural facility there that was squarely focused on reflecting the um, Native American cultural uh, history and legacy that they wanted to make sure was represented in the built environment. So we were able to fund the community visioning aspects, the compensation of artists who contributed to that visioning process, as well as the architectural fees um, to, to begin designing this permanent space. So I wanna just, uh, I'm gonna start to wrap up here and leave you with this, to be thinking about artists, cultural organizations, and culture bearers in your community, and the ways that they can really help to advance the work of the Promise Zone, um, as well as have significant local impact in your place. You know, I think sometimes the ways in which we um, imagine or understand arts and culture is sort of in the symphony hall or on the stage or in the museum, but really, um, what we're talking about here and looking to fund under this tent, big tent of creative placemaking are artists, designers, and culture bearers working in really unique and partnership ways to drive impact in place. And that can happen on your streets, 
um, that can happen sort of in your schools in all different places in your communities. Um, so I, I like to always sort of land and end on a slide like this to remind folks of, of why it's really worthwhile to involve artists and cultural organizations in your project work. We have a lot of great case studies work up on our website. Um, this is just a snapshot of some of the projects we funded in the past. If you want to read a little bit more deeply in some of the case studies, um, this is only, I think, 70 projects of the 600 plus that we've funded. But you can actually take a look at all past grants on our website on arts.gov under recent grants. So I encourage you to do so if you're just looking for some inspiration or even looking to see what's happened regionally or locally um, that you might be able to connect to. We also have a free online PDF of some of those case studies and essays from folks that have engaged in creative placemaking. And I want to just lift up uh, the robust COVID resources we've gathered on our website. Um, we recognize what a challenging time on so many dimensions this is for so many communities, particularly the arts and cultural community. Um, so while we're limited in the ways that we can directly fund and support those individuals who breathe so much life into our country, um, we want to make sure that we're collating the resources that folks can access on our website. So, so please take a look at that. Um, there might be some great things there. Also, if you want to learn more about creative placemaking, we have a series of webinars that we've done as part of our technical assistance program and we'll continue to do. Um, so I've included the link there. Uh, we put out a monthly newsletter. So if you just want to hear what's happening, what's going on in the design and creative placemaking program, shoot us an email at neadesign at arts.gov. And lastly, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the way that we actually fund and select projects is by assembling panelists. So for the Our Town program, for example, I'm going to be recruiting 60 panelists to review and adjudicate our grants. So that happens um, by folks who are artists themselves, community development professionals, um, you know, public artists, choreographers, uh, museum directors, local arts agencies, a whole range of people. So if you wanna learn what sort of the sausage making looks like and, and how um, projects are put forth, uh, please reach out as well at the neadesignatarts.gov or you can email me directly and say, hey, I would love to be a panelist. I'd love to review grants. Um, it's a lot of work. We call it arts and culture jury duty, but it's a great service to the nation. We have a modest $500 honorarium. And I think it's a great way to really learn the intricacies of, of how an application is reviewed. So with that, I want to turn it over to um, Nick because he's the one that's going to make it really real and, and be able to share um, what this work looks like on the ground. So thanks for your attention through that uh, pretty lengthy presentation. And we'll circle back to questions after we hear from Nick. Thank you. Muted. I, I hate to be that guy on Zoom. I apologize. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, let me pull up the presentation real quick. Um, once again, I am Nick Cretion from Youngstown, Ohio, uh, and I'm going to be talking about our project in place, uh, which is short for Innovative Plan Leveraging Art Through, through Community Engagement. Um, as Jennifer talked about, community engagement is absolutely pivotal to any public art project taking place. Um, and it was really the centerpiece of, of our, our town program that we took uh, in Youngstown. And the goals of this presentation is how to use that community feedback to facilitate these projects um, and, and really implement them in a meaningful way at the local level. Um, and then some of the do's and don'ts, what we learned throughout the way, takeaways, uh, and then even what we've learned a few years later in terms of maintenance and long-term solutions with the projects. Um, looking back, the city of Youngstown, uh, we, we are a legacy city in Northeast Ohio. This, this data is from 2016, uh, but we're a city of about 65,000. Uh, we've pretty much leveled off in terms of that population. We might have lost a few hundred more since then, but it's, it's pretty close to that. 
Um, the household income and sales price has gone up uh, since then, um, but, but it does show the picture of there's plenty of vacancy, 61% um, population loss since our peak, um, which was about 180,000 in a city built for 300,000. We, we obviously never grew that much and have to maintain that infrastructure for a city uh, many times our, our present size. So that presents the challenge of uh, vacant spaces, uh, many demolitions that have taken place in the neighborhoods, um, as well as our downtown, which uh, was built up as, as banks and steel mill office space and in, in, uh, in, in the 20s and 30s. Um, and, and we are now a, a 2020 city in terms of dealing with uh, residential and office space development type stuff. Um, the, the real planning for this project took place back in 2014 and 2015 as we unveiled the downtown vision and action plan, uh, which um, was a, a plan that came out of many stakeholder meetings with, with key partners, uh, the city, YSU, Youngstown State University, our health system, St. Elizabeth, now Mercy Health, uh, many downtown business owners, many artists who have been involved in, in, in downtown redevelopment, um, different other business owners, entrepreneurs, industrialists, uh, schools, because we wanted the perspective of the youth involved uh, in, in our planning. Um, the business incubator, the Youngstown Business Incubator was the number one university affiliated business incubator and they were a great partner throughout the way and provided space uh, for many of these meetings to take place. Uh, and then not, and many other anchor institutions such as the banks and, and other uh, community college places like that. Um, as I said, the downtown vision and action plan was really kind of the basis for a lot of this planning to begin. Um, and that was back in 2015, where we had seven initiatives and about 130 uh, different focuses and objectives throughout that plan. Um, but the public art, creative placemaking, and making downtown a destination was really the, the centerpiece of, of this plan um, as we moved forward. Um, and, and three priorities emerged out of the years of visioning sessions that we held, and it was uh, lighting, technology, green infrastructure, wayfinding, and parking and mobility. And those, those were kind of the key points in downtown that those were just the little pain points that people, oh, we can't find parking or have trouble navigating. Uh, there's not enough green space or there's places that aren't lit enough. Uh, and then the Youngstown Business Incubator and students down here with YSU, uh, there was opportunities to, uh, there were opportunities to integrate technology into many of these projects. And, and you see all of those themes present in the logo of the project that we put together, um, as well as using the public art opportunity site catalog, which was uh, a few, uh, a week or two, just walking around and, and driving around and scoping out sites of, of these spaces that uh, there's a blank wall space, there's a vacant lot, there's a public green space that could be utilized. Uh, and we use this as kind of the map for people to use in, in the planning stages of the in-place project. Uh, and, and you see there's connections, bridges, old advertisements, storefronts, uh, wall space, just different places that people could take advantage of uh, to in, in, in the planning phases. Um, and then the last planning aspect before the project even began was working with the CUDC, the Cleveland Urban Design Collaborative out of Kent State University. Um, planner, it's a combination of planners, landscape uh, architects and uh, other architect ma uh, majors and master degree students. Um, and they came in 2015 and did a three day plan for downtown where it showed the connections between the university and our riverfront, which had uh, been neglected and used for cooling for the steel mills, but has recently been redeveloped into uh, an amphitheater, a public park, um, and, and just visioning how that could be uh, better connected to the community. But all these planning parts before we had even began the project served as assets as we had, had moved forward with our project. Um, and we took all of these previous plans, the, the downtown vision and action plan, uh, the many meetings we held, um, the student work from the CUDC, and then even some student work from Youngstown State students into an exhibit uh, and, and invited the public to the McDonough Museum of Public Art, uh, focusing on these, uh, the five focus areas and allowed the public to, to view it in an exhibit for a few months. Um, it was a public meeting space for neighborhood association meetings, uh, planners, any sort of government workers were able to come and playing a part in this type of work were able to come see it. Uh, and it was real good to start these conversations. Um, 
and then in terms of the our, our town program it was awarded in uh, July of 2016. Um, we it was as Jen said it was a big team of many people who had contributed throughout the way of urban planners, business owners, artists, uh, politicians, and, and city workers um, that that had worked along the way, and we had raised over one hundred fifty thousand dollars of local match. So it was more than uh, we, we received one hundred thousand dollars and had a, over a, a two times that match. Um, Throughout the process, we, we had hosted meetings with the, with the planning group, kind of figuring out how, how do we go through this process and actually making an, an impact. Um, and and, and this, this slide really kind of shows how we came up with the support group um, that, that supported the project team throughout the way. We, we met weekly for pretty much a year to start the project and, and probably had phone calls more often than that. Um, and this was just the real technical assistance group, which I, I think is very necessary to have um, we had our, our city university planner at the at YSU, the director of the McDonough Museum of Art, a graphic and interactive design professor, uh, Killian Riano out of New York City, who is now with the CUDC uh, from, from this project, uh, myself, and then Terry Schwartz, the director of the CUDC. And so the application process, we, we were able to select five projects at $20,000 each to support a, a small scale intervention uh, but our requirements for the process were that um, each project had to have one artist and one resident and at least three people. Uh, so it could be any combination of those things, but we wanted to make sure it had a resident perspective, an artist perspective, and whatever came after that, we were just were able to benefit the project. Um, but we had received 15 proposals. Um, there were over 150 residents, people engaged throughout just the application process and many times that um, as we had implemented the projects and, and they've been there for a few years now, um, we've leveraged over $200,000, $250,000 of, of funds to, to support the projects uh, in the five focus areas in, in supported by the Public Art Opportunity Sites catalog. Um, as you see, many different teams, this was the public presentation where uh, the, the teams were actually able to pitch uh, what their projects were, not all were selected, but uh, it, it gives a good vision of uh, who was able to submit many different walks of life. We, we had a group of seventh graders, a group of eighth graders, um, and the seventh grade class was actually one of the teams selected. So they were able to talk trash to their, their older counterparts at, at their school. Um, and then uh, industrialists, artists, um, the, the, the uh, owner of our local flea market, the Youngstown Flea, architects, students, teachers, all across the board, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about the specific projects in a second. Um, and it was included in the YSU State of the University uh, speech from President Tressel. Um, and the, the five selected projects ultimately were the Wedge at Hazel Hill, Shipping Container to Bus Shelter, um, Light the Community, Solar Screen, and the Mahoning Avenue Archway. And I, I'll start kind of diving deep into the Mahoning Avenue archway, just discussing the, the different aspects of a project. Uh, but as you can see, it is a railroad truss for the old uh, rail lines that used to carry steel in and out of the community. It is now decommissioned in just this giant uh, concrete arch that was sitting on one of the main corridors into downtown. Uh, and at night it was dark and dreary and uh, just a blank space that could be reprogrammed. Um, and, and throughout the, the previous planning as it, through, through the exhibit at the McDonough, this was included as just an idea. Um, it was submitted as a project uh, working with a local artist and student, David Tamulonis. Uh, Joe Dickey Electric was part of their project team uh, and, and going through the design review process at the city, we, they, they were able to make this project become a reality. And uh, they went through a different uh, planning phase in terms of lighting and what would be best and, and, and last in, ter in terms of permanent installation. Uh, and you can kind of just see the full size and scale of uh, what five people standing under that archway look like. So lighting it up at night actually made a huge impact to people coming in and out of downtown. And it was a, a, a nice gateway uh, project. And, and installation, we, we had professionals do it, but they were able to cost engineer it to be effective. Um, committing their time and resources. It was, we pretty much just paid uh, cost of materials and, and install uh, things like that. 
Um, and, and the main takeaways from this project were um, it's important to connect the artists to opportunities like NEA. Uh, David is a great student and has gone on to great things since then, but without kind of having the project team to connect to him or others who are involved, uh, it, this would not have been possible. Um, it's, it's important to find mindful uh, contractors or professionals at the local level who can, who can help a project and, and are really interested in bettering the community. Uh, and then it's, it's also a process working with the city government to get approvals at times. And uh, just the speed of government doesn't move as fast as you would like. Uh, the city was great throughout the process, but it, that, that is something to be mindful of and, and just always follow up in terms of contractors, city, the many different partners at play. Um, second project is the wedge at Hazel Hill. This was a right of way when they redesigned the business college at YSU. It was, uh, they had to grade the, the hill and put it at a slope uh, for the road to be able to go up the, the grade of that hill. Um, and it was kind of just a blank green space that was left there um, that this project team came together and put together a uh, rain garden. They put hammocks where, where people can actually uh, lay in the space. There's a small performance stage, um, wild flowers, local native plants that don't need much maintenance, but are, are a part of that stage. Uh, and there has since been another public art installation uh, sculpture as a part of that site since. Um, in this site, our local councilman, Julius Oliver, the first ward councilman was a part of this project team. You see him speaking to the media there, uh, but it really just goes to show the, uh, the wide ranging uh, inclusiveness of the project of, of who was actually involved. And uh, before one of the, the downtown Christmas parades, it was used as a, we, we were showing Elf down there. So it, it, it's a all year round programmable space. The third project is the solar screen. Um, this was designed by two um, professors, a, a couple from Kent State, and I believe they're now in Pittsburgh, but these um, were 3D printed ceramic bricks uh, with, uh, uh, solar lights that charge during the day and then light up at night. And this, this is located right on the lawn of our former newspaper that has since shut down, but right next to the business incubator um, where they have the America Makes facility where 3D printing is, uh, is pivotal there. It was pioneered in, in a lot of different technologies in Youngstown with that. Um, but it, it is a gateway into the uh, front row uh, amphitheater portion of downtown now. And then the shipping container to bus, con shipping container to bus shelter, um, it, it was quite literally the name of the project, um, but it was a, a local sculptor, Tony Armini, an industrialist, Ed Macabobby, who works with shipping containers, uh, and another student had worked to take this uh, big, ugly shipping container straight off the trailer, uh, and they, they chopped it up, and they were able to fab it into a very large, very usable uh, bus shelter that was placed out outside International Tower where there's a lot of uh, elderly residents and, and people who ride the bus and it's become one of the most popular uh, bus uh, shelters in, in, in all of uh, the WRTA system. So it's, it's very functional, um, people love it. There was a lot of public engagement where we quite literally sat out there and said, what, would you, what do you wanna see in a bus shelter? How, and it, it's ADA accessible, wheelchairs can fit in, and you probably get more wheelchairs uh, into a facility like this compared to the smaller uh, traditional bus shelters. And, and there have been discussions about doing more uh, public art bus shelter type projects. And then Light the Community, this is the project by the seventh grade class at the Lewis School. Um, right, if you look at the bottom left, that is the city courthouse. Uh, one block away is the Lewis School. Um, and you can see them, that, that was them practicing and kind of rehearsing for their pitch uh, where they were projecting light up onto the wall of the city courthouse. Um, to the left of that is where the now amphitheater facility is. And this picture was taken from the uh, Market Street Bridge. So there's plenty of traffic coming in day and night. Um, and then there, uh, uh, during normal times would be more shows during the summer uh, where people would be able to see these lights up on the wall um, once, once it's dark enough. Um, it originally started as a performance space, but uh, one, one lesson we learned is you gotta be flexible in terms of how the planned developments take place in terms of the city side of things with the amphitheater. Um, and it turned into more of a projection based up on the poles where it can be protected um, 
and projected every night. Um, but it turned into kind of a graphic design experience where students could design slides to be put on the light poles. Um, and as I said, community engagement is pivotal, pivotal every step of the way. Um, there's the movie night, us talking to the people at the bus shelter, uh, planning the, the wedge at Hazel Hill and the rain garden portion of things, um, our introductory meeting, um, seeing where the footprint of the bus shelter would actually fit, because that was a big challenge, in making sure it would be accessible along the line. And then another one of the public meetings we held in um, I, I don't think we can call, we, we, we had to change the name from happy hour because it was university affiliated, uh, but we held monthly sessions where people could come and talk about their projects to flesh out their idea uh, ahead of time with, with the project support group. Um, and, and as you see, um, they are all very clustered in terms of downtown right along the riverfront and corridors uh, related to it, um, but it we, we see the projects of how they were proposed and how closely aligned the, the, the renderings came to the real thing. Um, and, and throughout, um, the, the project team was able to coordinate five projects at $20,000 each using uh, graphs and, and shared meetings. We had the, uh, we're all in different spaces in terms of Cleveland, New York, Youngstown, uh, and then the project teams that were all in between. Uh, but we had online support group meetings with them just hey, any problems uh, going through that process, helping them go through the city's process with design review. Downtown is a design review district where uh, any changes to the exterior buildings, walls needed approved and offering that ongoing technical assistance is uh, we had plotted every uh, major step along the way in terms of the project and, and, and worked with each and every team. Um, today, uh, you can see where the amphitheater to is, is now uh, there and how it projects on the walls. Um, it, it's, it's a bright spot of downtown overlooking the skyline. Um, WRTA loves this bus station. It's a part of uh, some of their ongoing planning as, as we work on other downtown planning activities. You, you can see the Mahoning Avenue archway from downtown. It's a little bit off the beaten path on one of the corridors, but uh, from the new hotel, it, it's very visible. Um, as I said, that, that is now the closed Vindicator site, but you can see the Youngstown Business Incubator there where the 3D printing takes place. Um, we were able to adapt one of the ideas that was not awarded uh, with our Youngstown sign in, in, in the Raymond John Wien Foundation Park um, and the additional public art project that took place at the Wedge at Hazel Hill um, was done by Tony Armini, one of the participants um, and a few other students. Um, the key takeaways from this project, uh, and we're getting to the end here, is it, it's important to connect and educate community stakeholders about their municipal systems. We're going through the process of procurement, uh, presenting, design review, contracting, all these fun things that you, you are in the back of your head, uh, but play a key, key role throughout the process. Um, we were able to, to work with each project team to make it as smooth as possible, but now they can go through that through that process and do it themselves rather than have to rely on a team that knows the ins and outs of it. Um, we were able to engage a diverse population um, who have been ignored in this planning process, whether it's students on campus uh, or, or, or racial minorities. Um, the collaborative expertise of the partners was able to make it uh, successful uh, in terms of both the partnerships and the funding from the local foundations that were able to support it. And we utilized years of community vision uh, in planning to, to seek these funding opportunities, which uh, was able to make it successful and aligned with uh, what the community actually needed at this point in time. It wasn't uh, fishing for a project, but it was actually aligned with improvements that we wanted to see in our, in our downtown. So uh, aligning the, these exciting projects with the downtown vision and action plan and the work of students uh, from the CUDC, from YSU, from the exhibit, uh, it, it was really neat to see it become a reality in the end, and it really did make a change and impact in, in downtown Youngstown. And that's all I have in terms of uh, presentation. As Jen said, I'd be happy to answer any questions, and uh, thank you guys for the opportunity today. Oh, wonderful. I'd like to thank you all both for your presentations. I don't know if you've had a chance to check in on our chat box, but it's been very active. <laughs> since our session started. So I do appreciate everyone sharing their comments. I have a few Promise Zone um, partners and community liaisons that are giving great examples of how this funding and um, these programs have 
assisted their communities. So actually, I'm going to go to our first question, and it's actually from Jake, who is my fellow community liaison out of Minneapolis. And it states, for the Mayor's Institute on City Design, I see a list of alumni mayors. Um, is there a broad awareness of this program, and is there any virtual activity this year? Great question. So um, I'll put in the website micd.org and there are virtual seminars taking place in lieu of our in-person institutes. And um, there, there have been some really great sessions. I mean, these are truly an opportunity for mayors specifically to have some closed door learning to sort of ask questions and not be sort of judged publicly around uh, different design issues. So I'm gonna send along um, the website and also be in touch. If your mayor um, is interested in attending uh, a future traditional institute or one of our upcoming virtual seminars, they're all up on our website and they're kind of running them and rolling them out um, and on an ongoing basis. And sometimes they also open up the opportunity to city planning directors or staff that are supporting the mayors um, around some of their design issues. So I'm glad you lifted that up, Jake. Great. Um, I have another question from Jen, but actually I know we will be pushing out these presentations to all the attendees and I believe I saw a link, but the question was, Jen, can you share again how to contact our state and regional arts agencies? But I do remember seeing a link that you provided. Sure, yep. So we have a link on our website to all of the state and regional arts agencies. Let me just send that back out. And you know, each of them have programs that run a little bit differently. So I would just encourage you to, all their staff is available publicly on their websites. Um, so I would encourage you just to, to reach out to them and make some connections and contact. I think some of them may already be well aware of the great work that's happening in your region or be able to point you towards artists or arts and cultural organizations that could be really great partners, or they might be able to provide some direct funding to support your project work. And I think it's also worth mentioning, um, I'm not sure the status of each of these, but through the CARES Act, uh, the NEA distributed some direct grant funding for organizations to continue their cultural organizations to continue their operations. And I know there's also state arts agencies who are granting out some of that funding as well. Um, some of those programs might have closed or some of them might still have open opportunities. But I, I just encourage you to take a look at the programs that they offer because they're different in each and every state. All right, our next question comes from Annette Emery. Do the activities need to be in a promise zone? Part of my neighborhood is in a promise zone, but not all of it. Nope, you can apply, you know, we can apply and receive projects from any place across the country, as well as the territories in the US. So um, I think what's really exciting about the Promise Zone framework is it gives a way to plug your project activities into this longer term vision, but it certainly, the NEA finds a wide range of project activities and types. Um, so we welcome those as well. Okay. So I have another question from Jake. Um, both the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, which are right next to each other, are in the beginning stages of establishing and supporting cultural corridors and districts. Any specific resources and funding you'd recommend for those efforts? And as a side note, many of those areas are areas opportunity zones. Um, so I think there are lots of great resources out there that sort of can fund and support um, cultural corridors and districts. I mean, one of the things that comes to mind first and foremost in Minneapolis and St. Paul is there are just countless incredible arts and cultural organizations there. Um, one thing that I'll just lift up specifically, Springboard for the Arts is an organization based in St. Paul, um, but really works nationally. So they have a wide range of incredible toolkits um, that profile different resources, sort of share different specific, you know, contracting ideas for how to do an RFP for an artist. So I just included the toolkits for change in there. Um, I think there's just a lot of different ways to really cobble together funding 
for this type of project work. Um, I think maybe, maybe Nick, maybe it's worthwhile for you to share a little bit about how you all leverage the NEA funding for that um, additional funding and some, what some of those sources are. Because I think people are getting really creative in how they put together um, the funding match, but even above and beyond. Sure. So we were able to take advantage of some training opportunities in St. Paul as well and visit Springboard, which was a, was a great opportunity. I'll, I'll echo that. Um, but locally, um, we were able to leverage match in terms of staff time spent on the project from a lot of the university staff uh, and the overhead associated with that. Um, and then the foundations, like I said, are, are great supporters of projects, but being able to, to leverage $100,000 into 200 or more uh, through their contributions. Um, we talked to our local convention and visitors bureau as we, we thought it would also be a draw to them. Uh, and there were a few other smaller commitments uh, throughout that way, but building up those, those larger commitments from the foundations with the smaller building blocks is, is really how we reached uh, our, our match commitment. Well, I think that is all for uh, our questions. I did put in the chat box if there's any other questions. Oh, I have one more from John Berg out of uh, Indianapolis. Are there any examples of past research requests or partnerships? Yeah, so in terms of, um, I'm wondering, is this sort of referencing back to sort of our funding opportunities? Because one of the things I think that is really great uh, to just quickly, maybe I can just quickly show you this. Give me one second. Um, on our website. Okay, so I'm just uh, showing you our website here to take a look at um, how, it, how it's structured today. It's going to be changing later this fall, but the same materials are on there. So under grants, recent grants, you can actually do this recent grant search, which is incredible. You can, um, it takes a minute to load because it's connecting into our our grant system on the other side. Uh, but you can do a search by location, by keyword, by program type. And we actually do have a whole, um, I, I neglected to share it, but a, a research grant opportunity as well. So you can see here all those different disciplines that I kind of talked about. So if you wanted to search there, you could look into the research and see some of the past grants that were funded in that discipline. If you wanted to just look within your state, just to get an idea of what are those arts and cultural organizations that you might be able to partner in locally. Um, you can even search just specifically by the Our Town Creative Placemaking Grant Program. This is a really great resource and it pulls up short program descriptions that could um, really help lead you to some ideas or some potential partners as well. Um, and then we do have our, our whole, let's see, research program, or research and analysis. Um, so I would just go on to that on our website under artistic fields, research and analysis, and they have a lot of great um, features to, to sort of take a look at. This arts education data toolkit was recently released. So if you're working at that intersection of arts education and wanna know what data sources are out there to sort of provide some baseline tracking as you plan activities out into the future, there's a lot of really great robust things. Um, if you have that specific question, just shoot it to me and I'll pass it on to a colleague. I, I don't know um, all the ins and outs of everything within uh, the agency, but I certainly wanna be sure to help drive you uh, towards the best person that can help answer that question. Um, and Johnny, I saw, I don't know if you saw this, but there was Marcus also was right. asking. Yeah, I was getting ready to ask his question. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's great to have an artist on this call, uh, this, yeah. this Zoom meeting today. Um, sure. So I would encourage other folks who are working in Promo Zones to check out his website, um, mm -hmm. to, to really know that there are social practice artists who are ready to engage, who kind of deployed and done this work locally in different ways. Um, so that's really a great place to sort of strike up a conversation and start imagining that future, but pay your artists, you know, they are folks that deserve to be compensated. I think what was great about the example Nick shared was that, um, you know, they're working hard and offering real contributions in community and should be compensated professionally for their work. 
So always be thinking of that and building budgets that include that funding line. Uh, can say from the National Endowment for the Arts, if we don't see artists in our project budgets, it's not likely a project that's gonna actually get funded. Um, so just keep that in mind. Okay. So we have a few minutes left. If anyone has any additional questions, you can enter them in the group chat. Or if you come across a question or you have a question after the session ends, you feel free to email me. I provided my email address inside the chat. It's johnny.a.lattimore at hood.gov. But if we don't have any more, I want to personally thank you both, Jen and Nick, for your presentations today. I felt they were very informative and it sparked a lot of great conversation. Um, and it gave me a lot of great ideas on some of uh, the resources that could be utilized in the West Side Promise Room here locally. So we do appreciate it. And at this point, I will turn it back over to Silas to close us out. All right, everyone. Thank you for participating in the 2020 National Promise Zone Federal Convening this year. Uh, we really enjoyed. There are still many more opportunities for the rest of the week for additional presentations. Please join us. Some of you already are linked to those meetings, but if you have not, please uh, connect with us and we'll definitely share you what the uh, remaining presentations are available uh, via this portal. Jen, Nick, Johnny, great job today. We appreciate it. We look forward to connecting in the future and hopefully we've uh, been able to give people information that they'll be able to get, use um, right, out, right now moving forward in their areas. So again, thank you all. And until next time, Johnny, great job. We'll see you later. Appreciate it. All right, have a Thank great you. have a great day you all. Thank you all. Bye.